I would say he's just letting the weight just kind of pull him right back. He's not like doing well, any control. Yeah. For me, for arms, the negative is very crucial for me because I, I want to feel it pulling on the bicep as it comes down, and that load is the, the bicep is taking that load. So mm-hmm. for me, like what Andrew just said, is he sort of just letting that drop, and not really he's not really using that negative to his advantage. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Gear with coaches Skip Hill, Andrew Barry, our guest, Coach Nate Spear, an IP pro, and myself, Scott McNally. All of our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com. Use our code THINK for additional savings over there. They're high-quality third-party tested supplements from a company that you can trust. We are brought to you by supplementsource.ca for our Canadians. And, of course, we're brought to you guys by Patreon. You can, If you know anybody who's part of the Patreon, you can thank them because they are literally a big part part of what's making this happen and thank you to everybody who's supporting our programming i've got a few patreon questions that you guys left me today plus we've got q a we're going to answer your questions for the last episode if you want to take part in the next show then comment below plus comments likes all that stuff it helps to boost our programming in the algorithm and also one more thing if you're new here let me encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell because we have several podcasts that come out week to week anyway uh welcome to the show nate and you had a freaking great topic man basically how to get intuitive with knowing how to take time off of training. You know, we, we all the time, we're, we're telling guys, the younger, newer generation, that these guys need to work hard when they're in the gym and then take time off to rest. We, there's all the cliches that go along with it, you know, that we grow outside of the gym and all that, but it's hard to break the habit. If we want to grow, how do we figure out when is it time to take more rest from the gym? Well, I feel like um, I made my most progress when I started taking more rest days, honestly. And I feel like a lot of guys, as you sort of become friends with, you know, guys that are like super heavyweights and open pros, right? Like a lot of them sort of follow the same guidelines as like when I started taking more rest, I responded much better. <clears throat> so and I think when you're younger, we're so we love the gym so much, right? So it's hard to take a day off or a lot of guys, you know, when they first start training, it's like, oh, I'm training seven days a week, maybe six days a week or maybe twice a day and it's really hard to get them to buy into hey like do you want results or you want to have fun you know and um like it just had me thinking because i have a lot of i mean you guys probably get the same thing with your clients but sometimes they'll be like hey i'm really you know they're sort of like asking to take a day off because they may feel bad i'm like nine times out of ten that extra rest day is probably going to be more beneficial than any kind of harm it's going to do you know what i mean and for me i got really good at I mean, me and Andrew are training right now together, like all the time. So like he can sort of attest to this, but like maybe one week I'll take an extra rest day. You know what I mean? Just cause sort of I'm going off with a feel of like, okay, maybe I'm a little bit more run down. Like I know I've been training extra hard this week. Whereas like the previous weeks, you know what I mean? It's sort of like your training gets a little bit harder, more intense. And you sort of, you know, maybe start losing your pumps. You're a little bit more achy, a little bit more slow moving. You know what I mean? Um, and those kind of things. And then usually, like for me, like let's say I take two rest days off in a row, which usually I go three, like we'll do like three on, one off, three on, one off, but maybe throw the second rest day in there to follow suit. So there's two rest days in a row. And I don't know about you guys, but I always come back with like better pumps, um, just a better connection, you know, to the muscle that I'm training. Um, and I just think it's done a lot of benefit for me <clears throat> making progress in later years of bodybuilding. And I think a lot of guys don't really look at that as how do I get better, right? It's always how, the training and, the, you know, like what gear to take, obviously, <laughs> is the top one. Um, but a lot of guys miss that part. And I think a lot of guys that put on a lot of muscle getting good at taking those rest days. Just don't take a week off because if you go to take a week <laughs> off, everybody's going to lose their shit like right away. Uh, are you familiar with what Skip's doing, Nate? Yeah, yeah, he's doing a week on week off or something. I know people are losing their shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely hilarious. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said too of the fact that your training, your level of training intensity, that has to be factored in as well. I mean, look, if you're a newbie and you're going in and, and you're still trying to connect that muscle with the brain, <clears throat> excuse me, and and with that signal and and you know, the nerve response and the signaling between the brain and the muscle and coordination and all that's completely different. I think a newbie, not that they don't need days off, but they can't generate that type of intensity. I think the more we train, the more intensity that we can generate does require 
more off days. And that was the biggest argument that people were countering with me. They're like, well, maybe you're just overtrained. Maybe, but I'm training each muscle group once a week. So when you look at it on paper, you're like, ah, I should be recovering from this. And, and another thing that should be noted too, in your case, Nate, is you probably have better recovery than the average person. Mm. You know, People don't understand that it's not. And I just wrote an article about this too, so I'm going to like plug it uh, for Elite FTS. But it's it's pointing out that there are so many more variables and components to a pro physique than what you see from a structure muscle belly standpoint, whether it be assimilation of nutrients, digestion. I mean, I laughed and said, I don't know of a pro that is going to be taking in less than you're not going to have a pro eating 150 grams of carbs a day, unless they're just in a world of, if they're trying, it's something extreme or extraordinary. Most pros are going to be taking in three, 400 car, grams of carbs a day on the regular. And they're probably depleting and that might actually be low. So it, it also comes back to the ability that to recover quicker because of all those things, assimilation of nutrients and just your, I mean, you're built differently. And I will, I got to throw this in here just because I think it's funny. Andrew, be honest. I know this is a small digression. But when he introduced Nate as an IFBB pro, but he didn't introduce you as an IFBB pro, <laughs> I, I couldn't get it in there and go, oh, Andrew, thank I, you. I, it's you funny when you, when as the words were leaving my mouth, I was like, you know, I'm trying to do like my intro and I was like, coach, Nate Spear. And I was like, and IFBB pro. I was like, but I, and I'm thinking in the back of my head, but I didn't say Andrew's an IFBB right, right. pro too. He's a good, yeah, like, he's no, a good I'll just honesty, keep going with it. In all honesty, what am I known for? Being a coach or being an I or you know, getting a master's yeah. IPB pro card. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 I wouldn't have it differently, you know. And it's kind of funny because that you brought that up because me and Nate actually were talking about this during our back training session today about like these watered uh how it's kind of watered down now in terms of the pro card. Everybody's a pro. Like I made a joke of like, oh, like my grandmother's a pro. She won the sixty-five plus class at the North Americans last year, and yada yada yada. Because we, we've met a guy at the gym, and he's from New York City, and he was coming up when like all the good guys were coming up in the eighties and nineties, and he competed in like the middleweight class at the Eastern USA's when there were twenty-five guys in there, and all of them looked like they were ready to move on to nationals. So it it just kind of like brings up those conversations of. You know, like we look at, I, I sent Nate a video yesterday of, um, it was Flex Wheeler, Chris Cormier, and they're just like tooling around at the gym and they're filming and they, oh, here's Tom, Tom Prince, 1997, Mr. Nationals champion, you know, of the USA. And it's like, those guys in my mind, like those guys were pros, you know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like, those guys had to wait in line like four or five years when they would have walked into any national qualifier at, at, at or pro qualifier from 2000 on and gotten their pro card the first time out. So, yeah. but still, you still have those traits too, where your recovery is going to be better than someone who's not a pro. It doesn't matter if it's masters, it doesn't matter. It, it, that all doesn't matter. It still sets you apart with those variables that make you a pro where I sit back and I go, yeah, I, I have, I have absolutely horrible recover a bit, recover, <laughs> Recovery ability. I can't believe I'm stumbling over those words. But anyway, my ability to recover is very, very limited. So that makes the fact that Nate is taking those extra days, it should make the rest of us with mediocre genetics and recovery ability to step back and go, oh, man, if Nate is doing this and he recovers probably arguably better than most, then maybe I should take a longer look or a better look at this as well. I want to add a little bit to that too because Nate also does he it, like taking rest days is rest days, but he also does a lot more for his recovery. I don't think there's more than a couple of days during the week that you don't have a therapy session, a chiropractic, a stretching session, or or some other type of you know therapy modality that he's including in his regimen as well. Yeah. So it's like you know the kid who's doing six days of training per week, training every body part twice a day, not doing anything about mobility, not doing anything about downtime, cortisol, adrenal resets, all that kind of stuff, like. How long, how long do you think you can do that, you know, until you start to really actually go backwards? And I think, you know, I, I tell a lot of my clients this when they're like, hey, I think I can add an extra training day. And I'm like, well, are you addicted to training or are you addicted to getting good results? Because we're getting good results right now. Like, why would we add another day and mess that up? And I think that's kind of the, the take home message there. So how do you know? Like, can you guys tell us then, like, how do you know when is it, when is it time? Cause right now we're just telling them you need to do it. And these are the things you're going to get and you need to do it. And these are the things you're going to get. 
So how can we tell that it's time or, or how can we get ourselves into a position where the way you the way you had phrased the question, Nate, was um, how, how can we learn to be more intuitive with taking time off? Mm-hmm. Well, I will say for me, it's just like a basic rule of thumb for me is as long as I'm training, like let's say even if I have a five day or six day a week or a three on one off or, you know, five day split with two days off, as long as I'm training four days in the gym for me, like, and my intensity is all there, like I'm sort of like, okay, I'm good to take an extra rest day. Because for me, four days is like a good rule of thumb, as long as you're training hard and intensity is there and everything's sort of firing. But I feel like if you're training really hard for, I'm not saying like that's my full on, you know, I'm training four days a week, but as long as I hit four days, like I feel comfortable enough to say, okay, I'll take an extra rest day off this week and I'll only train four days. You know what I'm saying? That's one thing. Is it, a, is it a little bit different too? Because I know we all have clients like this and you know what? I'm guilty of it. So I'll put myself out there. I have to actually challenge myself to not do this. Taking a rest day should not have anything to do with your plans because if it has to do with your plans, then you're kind of making that rest day work to the plan versus taking a rest day that you need. So it goes back to you talking about how much do you love to train. Now, we all do it. I know myself, I'm like, well, if I'm going to be out of town at Swiss, I'd rather not be, you know, I'd rather not have to train those couple days because it's going to be a giant pain in the ass to train. So I could make that a cruise week. And then we end up pushing cruise week or deload weeks a, a, a couple weeks, you know, later than they otherwise should be. I think that they should be first. And I'm not saying it's a bad idea to do that. What I'm saying though is the decision to take it should be based on whether you need it versus whether it fits your schedule with something that you're doing or traveling. You can make it fit. Well, I'll say this though, like nobody has lost any extra muscle from taking at least one extra day off during the week, right? right? Right. But you might be inhibiting your gains by adding an extra day. So, because I mean, you mentioned how we, we plan our rest days quite often around life, around things we have going on. I actually think that makes sense because like, I'll give you an example. Like I'm going away for the next three days for another road trip and I probably won't train any of those days. So in my mind, I'm going to be ready to go and firing come Monday, Tuesday. If you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's almost like I'm going to have this stored recovery that's going to allow me to propel me to have really great in-tune training sessions when I get back. Because I just don't think there's anybody, I mean, maybe like two or three of the top Olympians in the world can absolutely base their schedule on their exact needs of their physique to take the rest days when they need them. Whereas the rest of us, we got to earn money. We got, you know, we don't have sponsorship checks coming in that, that cover our lifestyles. I think... I think blending the two, I don't think it's a bad thing is what I'm getting at. I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I do want to be clear because if you, especially if you travel a lot, I totally get that. What I'm saying though is I'm going to be more convinced if a client comes to me and says I'm going to take an extra day off when they don't have anything going versus uh-huh. if they're going out of town. I, I'm not saying it's bad. I, I, maybe I, I probably didn't explain it the best that I could. But it, it's coming back to that idea or the principle of taking it because you need it or taking it because it's a good idea. It's going to increase recovery and you're going to benefit from it versus that you're going to be out of town. They're almost kind of, you know, I, at least I feel this way when it's me, it's almost a forced day or two off. I know I'm going to come back stronger. We know because we have that intuition because we have built that over years and, and decades, which arguably it does take quite a while to be able to honestly assess the feedback from your physique and how you're performing. So that kind of brings us, I I guess, to the point too, like Scott was saying, it's hard to come up with black and white variables because a lot of times it's just a gut feeling. It's, it's, it's like we do with clients. We, We don't sit there and go, well, this change needs to be made because these four out of the five things, that's not how changes work. There's a a gut feeling or a gut reaction. So let's try to be black and white about it. I'll start by saying that I think it has a lot in my situation, myself personally, has to do with contractile force. When I'm training, if I'm training and the, the muscles are contracting hard as shit and the pumps are good, I tried to stay away from the pump because obviously that's another issue too, but they kind of go hand in hand. So if your recovery is really good, the weights are moving more fluidly for me. Uh, the contractile force is there. 
everything feels even, everything feels fluid, the pump is there, and there's, well, I'll stop there. I'll leave it at that, because there's other things that I could run down. Um, that's me. I, I'd go with that one. That's a little bit more black and white. I've got so one. Think, I've got one just, to add. Oh, but go ahead, I'll, I was going to say, keep it really simple. If, I, if I'm thinking about if I need a rest day or not, then I probably yeah. do. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's a good that's, one. That's a good that's one. That's literally what I was going to say. Yeah. Yep. I, for me, when I really got to my lowest, uh, my lowest frequency ever, or my most rest days ever, was um, a couple of years back when I was at my all time strongest and I had some lifts that I was tracking. And I, it, it, at a certain point, when you're getting to your like your absolute strongest, I could tell the difference. I'd know that hey, if I were to say do this push workout right now, could I do the heaviest thing I had ever done? Could I get another rep on that? Or if I were to take one more day off, would I be able to do it the next day? You know, mm-hmm. it didn't matter as much maybe 18 months before that or two years before that I started doing push pull legs training five or six times per week. And it was fine at that time. Six quickly turned into five. And then eventually it just made sense because I could see I wasn't progressing in the gym the way I wanted to, that five then became four. And eventually it came down to three and it basically came down to like, actually at, at, at the end of that, that period where I was at my all time strongest, it was one on, two off, one on, two off. And I felt fantastic. I was literally my biggest at that time too, like the biggest I'd ever been. I know that everybody disregards uh, Cali Muscle because he's kind of, he, he, he was a really sensational dude. But he was one of the first people that ever told me about trying to cut that frequency back. And it was back in like, I don't remember, he had just gotten out of prison at the time. And it's before he got popular, I met him at the Arnold Classic. And he just, somebody, some company hired him to just stand around and talk about supplements, basically draw people in. But literally, like, nobody was talking to him. I walked by him, and I'm like, God, this dude is a freak. Because he was, like, just crazy looking up top, right? And, you know, I walk back by again, and nobody's talking to him. So I just say, hey, how's it going? And he pulls me in. We start talking, and he starts giving me his advice on training. And he said, my strongest I've ever been. I trained three times per week. And at that time, it blew my mind. I'm thinking to myself, how could a guy this size train three times a week? Uh, but, you know, it, I, I took it from there. That was like a little seed that was planted in the back of my head. And then years later, it finally made sense. But for me, in order for it to make sense, I had to get as strong as I possibly could. And then it, it just, it all clicked, you know? I knew if I had an extra day off, I'm going to get another rep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can echo that too. I mean, when I was working with Dante years ago, that was my strongest and it was three training sessions per week. And, you know, someone getting into that type of training, going from a traditional, more of a bro split, they're like, oh, this will never work. You know, this is, I used to train five, I'm only training three days a week. But if you have an open mind and, and you realize, oh, wait a minute, he's making sure you're fully recovered so that you can give 100% Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for those three training sessions. And you'll scare yourself of how, how strong you get. Yeah. You know? yeah. At some point, you get so strong that it like it, it, you start to rack up injuries. And at the same time, you don't necessarily put on muscle as fast as maybe a little bit more voluminous or frequent approach would apply. But, uh, but getting back to the topic, I think, you know, I, I think the other guys mentioned a couple of things that I totally agree with. But I would say, like, you know, also along the line of, like, um, you know, if it even crosses your mind that maybe I do need an extra rest day today, I think about this, like, and I tell my clients, I would rather you have three or four 100% training sessions per week than five or six 75 to 85 or 90% sessions. So what I'm saying is, like, you're not going to the gym, you're not just kind of tweaking around, you're not finding a reason to go talk to so-and-so across the room and spend 20 minutes in between sets. You know what I mean? Like, you see people in the gym, they go to the gym, And they do a set and they go and they talk to someone for 15 minutes or they go and check their phone and play around with that for 10 minutes. Like I'm talking about like you're motivated to get your sets done. You're motivated to do the exercises and you're feeling strong while doing it. So I think mentally, um, you know, mentally you should have an idea like, hey, you know, my my attention span is kind of waning in the gym the last few days. I think I need to add an extra day or a few days off if you get what I'm running at. All right. Well, we have a bunch of questions. We also have a, uh, a training critique. We're going to try to do those on a regular basis. I wanted to start this one out, though. Uh, Brian had asked a question to all of us, 
uh, he asked for all the shows. I want it, but it's a fun one. So I'm I'm uh, I'm throwing him a bone. I asked the guys on it's just bodybuilding. I want to ask you too, if you could choose five commercial machines to add to your home gym, what are they, and who is the manufacturer and model? If you know, cheers. It's a fun one. Yeah. And we're, we'll use Dusty's uh, constraints. He said the gym can be as big as you want. So he selected like a prime machine. You can have a prime machine in your home gym if you want. Whatever you guys want. Do we want to so, like break it down by body parts so and we each go around in order? Or um, or do we each – because, man, it's going to be hard to remember all. Probably just be all different, right? I mean, it could be anything, right? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I'm just anything saying like okay, for Okay. Because okay. I mean, I, I can jump on the first one. I, I absolutely know because I will. Uh, when we move to Milwaukee, I'm going to build a commercial gym uh, in my like either either in a pole barn or a large garage, so that I can take that commercial equipment into you know a handful of years later into a, a regular gym. I know one of the first pieces that I absolutely insist on having is a pendulum with an adjustable platform. Okay. And they have one at Animal House, and I absolutely love that. Um, that would that's number one on my. I can I can keep going, but if you guys want to alternate or no, I don't know how going. you want to do it, you keep going. You keep going. Keep going. Uh, I one of the one of the there's actually two pieces, two back pieces by Hammer Strength that I absolutely will have. One is the isolateral lat pull down. The reason is is because I like to alternate it. The contraction is something that I just cannot get from anything else that I have ever tried. And because I like to not do one arm at a side, one arm per side, oh, overhand grip, good point, oh. Nate. I don't like the under, it's just something that does not mechanically feel right to me. I refuse to use that piece of, that's just me. It's not built for me or I'm not built for it. I'm not sure, but it would be the overhand one. But I alternate them, left, right, left, right. The other one is the under grip seated row that is like a- Low uh, row? Yeah, you're rowing. You're rowing. Uh, see, it's a seated row. It's are not the handles the down here. Ones. Yeah, that. Um, or the, they? Uh, it, well, I guess they, they call they... it a low row. I guess they call it a low row. It's more of a um, rhomboid trap. Um, so it's not an undergrip. It's a. The handle's kind of V. Oh. At the okay. Do you get yeah, it's it, it, And it's actually a hard piece to find. What well, is huh. in my area? There's okay. only a couple of them in my area. But those two pieces for sure. So I know I'm up to three. So you got a leg um, machine, two back machines so far. And I am, and I know this one's going to see, seem relatively basic, but I'm not a fan of slanted um, Smith machines. Oh, yeah. I want a straight up and down, and one that goes, and, and even more importantly, it has to go to the floor because I want to do barbell rows on it, and I don't mm -hmm. want to stand on anything, and I don't want those stoppers oh, yeah. at the bottom. And mm -hmm. I want to be able to stand an overhead press without it hitting the top. So it needs to be tall enough for me to – for it to go all the way to the floor, but all the way overhead in a full locked out position for an overhead shoulder press. So um, you only need a five foot Smith or something. Okay, got it. Exactly. Basically the gnome <laughs> version. <laughs> uh, and number five, or uh, the fifth, because that's four of them. The fifth one would probably be, and you guys might scoff at this, um, but the wide hammer um, decline chest press. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're, cool. you're back on an incline, but I'm telling you, that is a money machine. Nate and I have been using it like crazy the last couple oh, of weeks. Have you? If oh, you, yeah. If you keep from just piling, you know, because you can pile weights on it and everything else. Yeah. But I go as wide as I can go. Okay. I set that seat, and this is how I learned about setting the seat all the way to the bottom position, was when I was working with Jimmy Kennedy. He's like, what, 6'6 six, six or something? Yeah. So, it was already low, and I thought, you know what? I, I might like the angle of that coming in. It just drives your elbows up and in so much with that wide. It's just a, a beautiful chest exercise for me. But again, I, here's an example of weights. If I'm at three plates or if, I'm, if I get to like three and a half plates on each side, I'm probably not going heavier than that. And, and I see guys that will – that are significantly smaller than me who can pile on three, three and a half, sometimes four plates, and they can just bang away on it. But they aren't doing them like I'm doing them. Mm -hmm. And hammer strength, you guys know with chest pressing, and I'll leave it at this because I can keep going on and on, but the reason that you can pile so many plates on it is typically because if you have the seat high enough, you can tuck your elbows. And it becomes an incredibly inefficient pressing movement. So 
if and I probably should take a video. I've got videos of it of me doing it on my Instagram. But it's night and day versus how the average person will use that piece. You guys are probably using it very similar to what I am. But yeah. I that's how I do it. That that those would be my five for sure. Absolute probably the first five pieces that I buy. It's a good set. Good set of mm-hmm. machines. So you had was that one chest, two back, one leg, and what else did you have? What, the, what Smith. I, the Smith. The Smith. That's right. Smith. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Who's next? I can go. Um, so I'll do Atlantis Hack Squat. Have you guys oh, ever used that? Yeah. I don't know. Where? Now that I think about it, no. I'm like, oh, yeah. No. It has an I, adjustable I don't know. platform, right? Yeah. It's very, very yeah. smooth. Anyways. So it's one of those things, like, even if your knees are, you know, iffy, it still is a good hack where I feel like the Cybex is the opposite. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the seated ham curl. Probably the ham tractor from Flex. And then speaking of Flex Fitness, I would do the chest press from Flex Fitness, the one that converges with the plates in the back. Nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I would do – it's funny because I actually like that one-arm – Hammer ISO row the supinated group. <laughs> Do you? Okay, that's and that's the difference because you're probably built for it. Where I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> um, so I would do that one, and then probably let's say Arsenal T bar row. Is that okay. five? Yeah. Supported or straight from the? Uh, supported, yeah, just supported. supported. Okay, yep. that's a so good I'm machine. Looking. That's a yeah. good machine. I like that. Does it have swivel handles on it? Yep. Yeah, yep. and you can move them in and out too. Yep. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Which got to answer? Right, I guess it's, guess it's my turn, huh? I'm just trying to think. Well, I definitely got to pick a Smith machine because you can do so much with it. Yeah, you know, from rows to stiff legged deads to pressing, all types of pressing, triceps. You do everything with it. Um, I'm I'm gonna go with the ham curl too. Uh, in terms of brand, I can't remember the name of it, but there's this one in Montanari's gym that. Nate, do you remember the name of it? What brand Probably it is? Yeah, yeah so I'm pretty sure. Tractor. <laughs> what, what is it? Ham tractor. Oh, that's the ham tractor. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the seated one. Yeah, that one is super seated. smooth. Um, I'm probably going to go with the Watson hack squat because we've also been using that lately. And the cool thing about that is that if you guys don't know, you guys should look it up. You can change it from a 90 degree down to like a 30 degree angle, like oh, in no set. Kidding. You could do it in set if you wanted to. Oh. Like, there's like this jack that moves it up and down the angle, right? And you can also oh. adjust the foot platform. But literally, you could make a mechanical drop set without changing the weight. You could start with like four plates, get you know as many reps as you can when when you're vertical, and then slowly bring the angle back as you go and so continue to get reps out of it. I didn't realize that's what it is. I'm trying to pull it up right now. Yeah, I've got a picture of it right here. So this. Mm-hmm. They had this at, um, uh, uh, what's his name, Doherty's Gym in uh, Australia. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And so I that use thing this also machine. goes vertical. What do you mean? Like it, you, like it sets up more? You literally, yeah. that thing can go from that angle all the way up to wow. stri- straight up and down. So you guys when are I saw way it, more trusting than I am. When I saw it, like, the whole time I'd be like, something's going <laughs> to fail. You, look at the stuff be... behind. Look at the stuff behind the uh, in the lower left hand corner. Do you see that yeah. hydraulic stuff going on there? Yeah. So, yeah, that, 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 there's, a, there's a crank that you can't see on the other side that you can adjust that piece up and down. So, I didn't mess with that. I saw all that, but I'm like, man, I never mess. I'm in a gym. I don't ever train in. I'm in a, the other side yeah. of the world. I'm not pressing any buttons. I'm just going to use it as it is. You yeah. know what I mean? Okay, For just sure. so I understand, I, I just want, and, and if I'm asking this question, people listening might think or watching might think the same thing. Clearly, it's only the back that adjusts. No. The platform well, stays constant. No the, platform, no, the platform will adjust with it. Okay. The foot but, platform you're asking. Okay, so so just so I understand, so I would ask, okay, if the platform... No, okay, adjusts, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I get what you're saying, Skip. So there's there's three or four different settings that you can adjust that foot platform up or down with these little, uh, lip, um, what do you call them, stoppers. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Because right. yeah. okay. I'm thinking, wait, wait. <laughs> if you're just going to be leaning back and everything, it's the same angle. Okay, I got you. I yes, got you. yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So that's what three. 
Um, I'm probably going to use that prime chest supported row for back just because you can do, you know, some stuff to work your upper back. You can do stuff to uh, position your elbows to work your lower lats a little bit more. Is that the one where uh, you're like face down? No, this is like the chest one where you're, you're facing in. It's, it's the one, it's got like the three different legs yeah. to put the weight on to change the, where you're so emphasizing the prime one. It almost looks like an inclined bench. Yeah. Yeah. But you, yeah, you're, you're laying out. That's a different down. one. Okay. Yep. Yours that's that's different. a different one. All right. Yep. Um, and then I'm probably gonna go. There's a um, there's a company called Jim Lico. Um, they make a chest press. It's similar to like the Hammer Strength Arsenal stuff. Um, I like that one because as as me and Nate were talking earlier with another person, another trainer from MI40, this one has like three or four different settings where you can put your wrists or put your hands versus it doesn't have to be a, an exact 90 degrees if you want to bring it in just a little bit. You know, because most of us, especially as we get older, those straight 90 degree bars, whether it's a row or a press, they just don't work for the wrist, to the elbow, to the shoulder, you know, whether we have obstructions or whatnot. Whereas I think more of a slightly neutral grip is much more advantageous, um, not just for your, for, your, for your pressing, but for your, your, your joint health as well. So is this, this is, did you say chest press? Yeah, it's a Jim Lico. Jim Lico. Yeah. Jim Lico. Yeah, it's a Swedish company in the U.S. They're sold out of Canada. Is this the one where it's setting up more like this? No. No, it's more of like your similar to like an Arsenal incline press. It's like an incline. That's the one Nate was talking about. Okay. Right, Nate? Yeah. Well, this is similar. Okay. Gotcha. Nice. I like the Jim Lico stuff, um, and it it would be really good for a home gym too because the footprint is so small. It's not on big those machines. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I saw them at uh, the at um, FIBO. They had that mm -hmm. whole equipment hall, and they had all their stuff there. Uh, it, it, I like their equipment a lot. It's like you could literally put their hack squat and their leg press in the space where my hack squat is. Yeah, like, uh -huh. but I mean, you're paying like five grand for each of those things. They are not cheap machines. They're not cheap. No, man. I no had, one uh, said. No one said pec deck. Because like you could do dumbbell deck. flies if you really wanted to do that movement. No, yeah. I agree. I agree. But I, I do find it odd that these days, even old the old school powerhouse here that was going in and and ended up failing, they had to close. But I expected them to have it. My. And I'm going to tell you, there's only one that I like, but I do think it's badass. And it was made by Body Master, and it was you were back on an incline, mm -hmm. but the pads were straight up and down, so they didn't incline with you. So uh -huh. you got kind of a almost like a decline, and yeah. the pads were real thin. And that's my biggest problem with pec decks is the bars and the pads seem to be thick, so that you can't get your elbows very close together. This yeah. one, your elbows would get like they'd literally be like this close together. Huh. It was really good, but I haven't used that in years, and I haven't seen. It's one of the pieces of pieces of equipment that I rarely see in even hardcore gyms anymore. Is a good pack deck, and I agree there are other options, but if you get a good one, man, that can be. They are nice. They are. Yeah. They they really are. I think, and and it's just odd to me that that was such a popular piece, and it and if the the mechanics are right on that piece of equipment, it can be really good. But they're very difficult to find these days. I had one machine I said, because I, I have my five already. I already bought them, too. You know, like I have my stuff. And I just went with all leg equipment. But there's one right. thing that I've got my hack, leg press, extension, and curl. Like, because you got to have, if you're going to train legs, like you can't just have a hack squat. Do you know what I mean? Like to really get it done at home, you need all that stuff, in my opinion, to like to like replace the, the, the commercial gym. Um, but there's a row that I would love to find. And it's one of the hammer strength rows. And I, I had this video I found of it from a, a couple of years back. So the show came out today. It's just bodybuilding guys as we're recording this on the day that it's just bodybuilding comes out on Wednesday. So I sent this over to Ron and Dusty. I want to show it to you. This is my all time favorite row machine. Um, let's see if I can turn the volume down here too. There we go. Hold on a second. There we go. I got the volume. Yep, that's down. the one I hate. <laughs> I <laughs> love this it. machine. This yeah, is the one you like, Nate? Yeah, yeah. I, I like it one at a time, though, personally. I could see that. Yeah, yeah. That's really nice. To me, this is almost like a pull down the or yeah. a pull over. Sorry. Yeah, it's like a pull down, but there's like a pull over quality. The way my arms are coming down here, it feels like a pull over right there. 
and I could activate my lats in a way that I had not previously. Like it, it just for me, this is absolutely perfect. And the one right next to it, if you look behind that machine, yeah. it has the close grips with that little mm-hmm. V shape grip. I don't like that one. It's a completely different machine, even though yep. it's it's basically the same style of design. And I like you know? the other one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't like want it. it my I don't I don't like it so much that I'd have it in my home gym. Yeah, but I do like it as a as a pretty good variation. But that's that's the individual part. That's why I say, you know, I've complained before. My scapula won't open up. I'm very narrow shouldered, narrow clavicle. You know that sort. Of, so that probably plays a part into why the why I don't like specific back or back machines uh, or back exercises like that. You guys are wider than I am. <laughs> don't pat yourself on the back too hard because it's not difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We did have some other stuff. Like I said, we had a bunch of listener questions. I want to bring, since we're talking training, I wanted to bring one more thing in. Um, I know you guys saw this video that Skip posted. Uh, I thought, uh, we, why don't we talk a little bit about this? And maybe we can use this as a segue into our into our uh, training critique, too. But this is Skip <laughs> blasting some biceps. Look at those freaking now, I remember veins, too. The caption on it was something like, you can make fun of my weight, but not the form. I would make fun of 70 pounds. I think you said it was, right, Skip? Yeah, it's only a 70-pound barbell. Yeah, Yeah, but like I think, and I think this is a point that, that should be talked about because I think all of us probably curled more in our 20s than we did in our 30s and sure. 40s and, and, and older. Yeah, oh, because, yeah. But because you learned how to actually curl and get a solid contraction. Like, you stopped ego lifting on the biceps and the triceps on, and, and the, all those movements because you're like, well, wait a minute, this is doing absolutely nothing for my, my biceps. It's killing my elbows. It's killing my shoulders, yeah. but it's really not adding, you know, inches on my arms. Yeah, that failure right there, my, I would have tendonitis after this workout. Well, like well, I, I'm, I'm impressed <laughs> that he can do a straight bar curl. Yeah, honestly. no kidding, right? Like, it's very. You see my hands at the top. They are, I let them move. It's a hook grip. And then I let them move so that they can rotate at the top. See how mm-hmm. at the top they see that, that left uh, wrist row. Otherwise it hurts. Mm-hmm. It's so it'll start with a hook grip, but it ends up almost like low on the palm of my hand at the top. Like I, I can't remember last time I did a straight bar curl. So I give you yeah. the props for that. Yeah. yeah. And you look fucking jacked. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. No kidding. Need a tan mm-hmm. though. Yeah, <laughs> you need to work on that tan. That is for damn sure. All right. <laughs> so we did have a training critique. We get into that. Let me see if I can pull those up here. So uh, this is from Chris, and he we initially he showed me some chest stuff. We talked about what he was going to send, and we were trying to work on big compound movements, things like chest, things like back, things like compound leg exercises. And he sent me some chest stuff, but the videos didn't work right. So he's like, here, I sent you some arm stuff. So I, <laughs> I guess we're, we're doing some bicep reviews today. Um, I'll start with this one. I got one of his bicep exercises and one of his tricep exercises. And we'll see what he's got going on here. And I want to hear what you guys have to say here. He's a big dude overall, a lot of muscle. I would say he's just letting the weight just kind of pull him right back. He's not like doing well, any control. Yeah. For me, for arms... The negative is very crucial for me because I, I want to feel it pulling on the bicep as it comes down. And that load is like the bicep is taking that load. Hey, what's up, guys? I have a lot of people who reach out to me on a regular basis who are trying to more effectively reach their goals. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is that they're not getting enough protein. And there's only so much chicken breast we can eat through the day, but we can easily add a high quality protein supplement to boost those numbers up. True Nutrition has just about every protein powder you can think of from high quality weight isolate. If you don't tolerate lactose, then you could use their beef isolate or you could use their pea protein isolate if you don't eat animal products. They literally have everything you'd think of. I've believed in them for like a decade before they advertised with us. And they they never went out of their way to say like, hey, we want to promote our stuff through you. I literally asked them because it's a company that I believe in. And at the end of the day, I want to see you guys reach your goals as effectively as possible. So if you use our code, think at True Nutrition, you'll get some savings, you'll help to support our programming, and you'll get some high quality products to more effectively reach your goals faster. So for me, like what Andrew just said is he's sort of just letting that drop and not really, he's not really using that negative to his advantage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of looks like that guy. Uh, we're all kind of thinking the same thing. It could be slowed down. It could be held at the top. This is not to me. 
uh, and, and you guys may feel differently, but it's not a movement that is to move a lot of weight. It's more exactly. like I would use something like this as an opener. I call it stretch and squeeze. I would have dead stop both ends. That's just yep. me, though. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. When you say dead stop both ends, do you mean you would come up to the top and stop as well? Or what are you saying? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, both ends. I would dead stop at the bottom. I would dead stop at the top. I would make it a stretch and squeeze. And, and honestly, his biceps would be on fire if he did that. And he would be probably cut those reps in half. Hmm. Yeah, the I other the way it. he's doing it also opens him up to a, a, a bicep tear. Yep. Um, when you just kind of let the weight pull you like that. If that force yep. exceeds the, the the strength of of the um, bicep tendon there, um, it, you're opening yourself up to a bicep injury. And it's the angle too, because the angle of pull is behind him, and mm-hmm. people need to be reminded over and over that that bicep attaches over the shoulder. It's the same mm-hmm. thing with like a, a an inclined dumbbell curl. It's a very vulnerable position. You know, we tend to look at preacher curls. Oh, preacher curls are so dangerous, which quite frankly they are. That's why I like a pad below my elbow. Mm. on a preacher curl but that's getting that's deep diving i guess because we're not talking about preachers but um i will not have my elbows hanging over a preacher curl and and be able to go with full extension because it's to me it's just an accident waiting to happen but i agree that angle of pull is behind him and mm-hmm. that's a vulnerable position you know, i was slowed it down yeah. that's vulnerable i was gonna say actually last- what we're going to skip is actually to make that movement more effective i might use something to make it a preacher curl or even just bring over a seat and then ah. stick an elbow in your leg like those old prison curls you're going to get way more isolation that way because you see how his elbow is going back and forth we don't really want that on a curl in my opinion the elbow should be real so i think ahead. you could still turn this exercise like if you just had a little more control he could still lock that elbow in place by, tri- by driving moving, his tricep yeah. into it yeah driving a tricep into your side as kind of like a base the same way you would drive your elbow into, say, like your your inside of your knee, like you're talking about, Nate, for the um, like the prison curls. All right, and then we got it. Looks like a dumbbell curl here. I would do one arm at a time here, and I would. I think he needs to turn his elbow outwards more so that the um, the dumbbells. If he's, I mean, he's kind of doing like a cross between a regular hammer. You mean and more a, out um, like that? Yeah, like more more of like cross a, body almost. Yeah, I was going to say, this is kind of a cross between the two. And I think because if you see his position, I'm, I'm trying to show, like he's leaning over, like he's going closer to the dumbbell, shortening the range of motion. Ah. See, see how he's kind of hunched over? So he's yeah. cutting off his range of motion, whereas if he stayed more upright and drove across his body or even just straight up one at a time, he'd be getting an extra two inches of, um, of uh, range of motion there. Can I add a tip here that is not going to be something you're going to see visually? And I think it's very important. I have very, very strong forearms. If everything else on my body was built like my forearms and my calves, then I'd have a much better chance of getting a pro car. <laughs> anyway, what I would say is this, and this is something that I do, and it, it looks like he's he may be doing this part of it. I put my grip so that my hand is against the top plate. And the reason I do that is because I don't choke the shit out of – I take my grip – out of it as much as possible and focus more on the brachialis because I don't want the grip. I don't want my forearms to be on fire. I want to hit, dig into the brachialis and try to, and that's honestly part of the reason I do like that. He's bent over a little bit. I don't, I don't have much of a problem. I see what you're saying that the range of motion could be uh, decreased a little bit, but I think if you don't choke the grip and you have the top plate pressed against, you see my hand pressed against the top of your hand, Mm-hmm. You don't have to choke it, and I think it won't impact your – And to the point where when you do a lot of gripping, and people will probably relate to this. You guys will too, I think. If you overgrip for back or you overgrip like you did a bunch of these sets, you go to wash your hair about two hours later, and your forearms are going <laughs> to cramp up and lock up. Yeah. You have a lot of experience with that, uh, washing your hair, Skip? Yes. <laughs> I'll try and try to shave or something. <laughs> you, you left it open for that one. <laughs> so but it's a relatively I'm, loose grip is, is what yeah. I'm getting at. You know, you obviously yeah. you got to hang on to the dumbbell, but it's not choking it. It's letting that plate sit against your hand. And I think it move. It takes a lot of stress off the forearm down into your basically closer to your wrist. And it puts it, I think, where he wants it, unless he's doing it for forearms, too. But we do hammer curls for brachialis to help bring up. 
uh, or help make the biceps sit a little bit higher. We're going to say something else, Nate. Yeah. So I was saying, I noticed, see him lock out at the bottom. So I would stop that and keep constant tension and also ah. slow that negative down, negative down again, like we said before, but you can see him almost like thrusting as he comes down. Yeah. Like I would stop that like about like 5% before Oh, he that. is. He's forcing the extension. Yeah. I didn't He's flexing that. the triceps to, to yeah. fully extend yeah. the arm. Which... Like press down. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Got a, got another one here. We got to have some tricep stuff. This one. I think again, he just goes fast. He just like gets the rep over with versus um, living in the time under tension where, mm. where you're really feeling it stretch and pull. Yeah. Um, now, okay, maybe we should also think about like what background is he coming from? Is he from a powerlifting background, a football? Because like if you're doing football training, this is how your football coaches want you. They want you doing these sure. explosive reps. They want you to get the guy off you. So they're teaching you. Um, all your weight training movements are explosive, get off me as fast as possible type stuff. So maybe that's his background was, was some type of, you know, athletics or whatnot, or, or powerlifting or strongman. Um, or even if you're going to explode, even if you're going to explode on the positive control or hold the contraction and control the negative a little bit more. If you're, you know, if you just feel like, well, I get a better contraction if I move the, the positive part of the rep a little bit harder, but I agree. It's a, it's a tempo, a rep tempo thing for me. I think yeah. if I put mine up next to it, there would be a dramatic, a uh, very large, um, the disparity in, in rep tempo. Could Absolutely. we say that maybe the best, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, because he's leaning forward, what I like to do is when I lean forward like that on triceps is bring my elbows a little bit more forward, and it makes it much harder. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, instead of having his elbows right to his side, I would almost mm -hmm. have his elbows out forward a little bit, and it's going to make it way harder, and you might get a better contraction that way. Have you guys ever done that? Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. yeah. And he has that big chain to be able to bring those hands next to – it's not like he has a bar mm -hmm. where you can't yeah. bring – the hands, you know, alongside of you or to get a, like, basically a, just a more of a range of motion. A bar would keep those hands in front of him. And I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying that that's the difference in using those handles in a chain that, that has the ability to go wider like that. Yeah, personally, I would even, maybe it's just my stance. I would want it a little bit shorter, than, just a little bit shorter so that I could stand just a little bit closer to the machine without it bottom well maybe he's not really that close to bottoming out but i'd like to be able to stand personally a little bit more upright and as you're saying you know like the other side of it nate um i would almost think too but about you guys ever try to like take your hands and push them beyond you you know right, I've heard, that's heard, I'm, yeah. okay yeah. Yeah, yeah i guess i'm just saying it in a slightly different way <clears throat> I, on that explosiveness on the concentric i was just talking to a guy about that today i all the videos I've looked at from him, he goes the same speed on everything. Mm -hmm. It's very controlled. And I, I do think there's something to be said for, you know, guys are trying to slow the negatives down. And I think sometimes I getting more explosive will, I it will activate more fibers. You know, I, I'd asked Scott Stevenson about that, which I think he's with us in the past. And you can feel the difference. Like if you're on a hack squat and you just like, you know, do your slow negative and then bring it up at the same speed and go back down and bring it up at the same speed. Do like two reps of that and then do a couple of reps where you just like drive it up aggressively, controlled, of course, still. And you you have to decelerate at the top, but like add as much freaking force into that as you can, you know, while controlling it. And like you'll feel the difference just in those two reps. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. There is a counter argument to that, though. When I look at physiques, like I, the person who came to mind right away was Roman Fritz. Okay. He trains very, very controlled, positive and negative. So he's limiting his weights. Obviously, he's, you know, trying to dig into the muscle as much as possible and create that, that stimulus. But he could certainly use more weight and explode up and, and control down. Yet, at the same time, my counter argument is this seems to be working really well for him <laughs> I mean, <laughs> because his leg development is so damn good. Does Nick explode? And and then control, or, do, or is he no. controlled on the way up? Nick's really down? slow in, in both directions, isn't he? Okay. But he made that shift about two years ago. Okay. 
like he he was just all about getting strong for a while there but then he made that shift to really really like he had a video up a couple months ago about like you know i see guys pressing these 150 pound dumbbells 140 pound dumbbells and they're they're going up and down like this he's like i'm 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 285 pounds right now you know 10 percent or under body fat and i'm doing it like this and, and if you can people that are listening it's like a three second negative and everything that he's doing is geared to contract the pecs, not move the dumbbells, contract the pecs, mm-hmm. okay? Because there's a big difference with that. You can use your shoulders and triceps and your back even to help you just rack out some weights. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, there's. I don't really think there's a reason for guys who don't have my development to be using more than 100-pound dumbbells on this type of exercise Because if your goal is to make your chest bigger. And he's got a really good point there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I will say, though, that it, it depends on where you're coming to get back to what you're saying, Skip, like to counter that. I think it depends on where you're coming from. You know, like the guy I'm talking about, that's all I've ever seen him do is moving the weight at this continual motion back and forth. And I think that you could if you have like I did that at a point and it was it was Shelby who had told me he was like, hey, what if you tried to get more explosive? And yeah. when I did, I noticed that like a set of eight would cripple me for the, the same set before that. I didn't have to use quite as much force to do that same exercise with the if, if I were using, say, like a two second, a two second up on a hack squat versus just driving it as hard as I can. Of course, still decelerating and controlling it at the top. You know, I think that the, the at the end of the day, it comes down to still having some level of control. Sure. What's the big joke? And it's a different stimulus. What, what's the big joke about training? Like, like, what's the best training program? Your next one, right? Right. Yeah. It's almost you can kind of use that same mindset here of like, okay, what's going to fuel my my future gains? Changing how I'm how I'm doing my reps. So maybe if you're a very slow and steady person, absolutely switching over exactly. to something more explosive. Sure. And on the counter, if you're just this explosive up and down, get the rep done at any cost type of person, employing you know now a three second negative, a full pause, and then a very controlled two second concentric, maybe that's going to fuel your future gains. So yeah. get, stepping out of your out of your normal box, I guess. One hundred and ten percent. And let's be fair. Look, I'm already only curling 70 pounds. I don't want to drop to 40. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, we got a JM press here. Yeah. And I'm going to go on record and say I hate him. Not him personally. I don't like that press because it scares, it scares me because I can't stand that that angle is so closed. I want it open. And I, I go so far as to tell my clients that if you're going to do them, I don't want to see a video of it. And if you injure yourself, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> now, I like him on a Smith. That's a pretty bold statement. I get it. I, I like him on a Smith machine. Where does the bar end up? In the it bottom depends position. on where, where you position yourself. It depends on how, like, do you want it to go right to your nose? Do you want it to go to chin level? Um, you could position that based off how your, your elbows feel. Fair enough. And you can change, you know, I like doing it on a slight incline too. So yep. I'll do like dumbbell skull crushers and sometimes I'll open it way up and sometimes I'll close it down to the point where mm-hmm. the dumbbells are maybe coming down next to my head, you know, the top mm-hmm. top of my head region. I don't quite go, you know, to the point that, that he is here. Is there anything you guys would want to suggest to him with this movement? I gave mine. Get that don't hard do, don't do it. <laughs> exactly. Get that bar to the top of your head. I mean, I'm sort of on the same page as Skip. I just never really got into them, honestly. I just never really felt comfortable with them. But, I mean, I don't really see too much. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong, necessarily. Yeah. You guys ever do a um, like a dumbbell skull crusher on the floor and yeah. dead stop it behind your dumb. head? I like I those, those a lot. Those are like Dante thing, right? Dante does those? That's he started with a barbell. It was with a barbell, straight oh, bar. Okay. Yeah. And it's called a dead stop dead stop uh triceps extension or you know, dead stop extension. And I can see um, that I, working good. Quick story is uh back in the like fifteen years ago I'm training in the gym and this guy who I thought was just like a regular gym bro, you know, he's a little bit older than me. Me and my training partner were doing that, and every time you do it, it makes a little dink on the ground, you know, yeah. because you, you're coming to a dead stop. But it's not like deadless or anything. It's not shaking the room or anything. Right. And this guy comes over and he's like, "You really going to be making that noise every set?" And I thought he was kidding. And I'm like, "Oh yeah, funny, you know." 
yeah. and then he walks away and then my buddy goes and he goes so you guys really are going to be doing that the whole time huh and i'm like oh you're serious and then he kind of <laughs> got into it and he's like well this is the last time you're ever going to see me then and he like walked out of the gym what gym was, was this the, it was just a health club that i used to work at years ago oh, okay and i'm like it was like one of those like is there a hidden camera in here? Like, yeah, how yeah is this exactly. Because we actually had those those uh, yoga mats underneath too, so it was deafening the noise even more. And yeah. It wasn't like, like I said, it's not like doing rack deads or, or deadlifts or anything. Yeah, it was just like the weirdest gym encounter I ever had with somebody. And was is that it the weirdest? Or was that a while ago? It was that. Was it recently or was it a while ago? Uh, no, it was like 13, 14, 15 years ago. Okay, said, because, and the reason I ask is because. I know I don't want to get off on a again on a tangent, but the air the the noise from weights or noise from people grunting twenty years ago was totally accepted and you're in mm-hmm. a gym for Christ's sake. I don't I don't understand mm-hmm. it. And these days everybody will look and they'll look at me and kinda of roll their eyes and I'm like, I don't I don't care how much noise somebody he's over there I don't even care if it's just I don't know, wanting attention. I don't really care. We used to yell at each other from across the gym, not knowing who it was, just to be supportive. So yeah. to me, and I understand I'm an old head, but that's just, I don't, that's one thing I don't want to give up. You're mm-hmm. in the gym. You should hear weights. You should hear people working hard. You should hear grunting. And if someone is doing it because it's self serving and attention seeking, then I don't know. I guess go for it. I don't care. I'm not going to try to figure it out. Yeah, you're saying you go into a gym with an acceptable level of violence, in a sense. Like, yeah. like, like it, it should exactly. have like an air of like some intensity, some testosterone yeah. in there, which I absolutely. Agree with you. Yeah. you did yeah. say, uh, Andrew, that that was the weirdest gym encounter you've ever. All right, had. It wasn't the weirdest. So I was gonna say, I feel like you you've probably had other weird ones. I almost like in the back of my head, I'm like, there's a topic for a future episode yeah, there right is. there. The weirdest gym encounter you've ever had. Because there's, yeah, yeah. We, should, we should save that one. We'll have to think about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, this is going to be way off topic of bodybuilding. In fact, complete opposite of bodybuilding. But I wanted to put it up here anyway. Um, for BSG, this is uh, Jonathan from <coughs> Patreon. Thank you for uh, your support, brother. He says, um, if you weren't able to have a career in anything fitness related, what do you think your career would be? Also, what is your dream job? This one's Andrew's easy. <laughs> What's that? I know, I know what Andrew's going to say. <laughs> well, no, actually, I'm going to say I would invent this website where you could literally type in anything and then that stuff gets <laughs> delivered to you within two. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, man. Andrew froze. I'm going to finish his statement for him because apparently he froze, but I think we all know where he was going with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said two. He wants to be Jeff Bezos, apparently. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Damn. Uh, You guys won't, you'll be surprised at mine. Nate, go ahead. I'll wait. I mean, honestly, I I wouldn't mind doing deep tissue massage, honestly, just because of being so in bodybuilding and muscularity and intrigued by it. And I've already started doing stuff on myself and learning. Yeah. About the process and it's really interesting to me and I think you can help a lot of people and there's not enough massage therapists that are honestly they get their certification and they just go about their way and they stop learning whereas yeah. guys like us that are so passionate about bodybuilding we're always learning off the clock right so I think that's what makes us so good as coaches we're always if I'm at home and, and like doing nothing like I'm probably watching some kind of educational or some kind of bodybuilding knowledge and I'm continuing that so I think it's the same way with body work i'm just very intrigued by it and like learning from guys like Derek farnsworth who's worked on me and karen out in las vegas like it's very those guys are just levels above like regular massage therapists and yeah. it's really intriguing that i think i would be able to do that if i really wanted to i guess peter's with us and he said i'm going to see nate's body work guy tomorrow in ma oh nice. have to do that yeah <laughs> Oh, Andrew <laughs> said his computer that. froze up. He's he's rebooting. Does that mean I'm going skip so that you Go. can you can hold off? Okay. Go for it. Um, I honestly, my what would be my dream job? I kind of honestly have it. Like I'm not gonna lie. This is, yeah. you know, I, I feel really happy with this. I kind of feel like you probably have the same thing going on right now, Nate. Like you get yeah. to freaking live your dream as a bodybuilder, and both of us came from a place where life was not quite as awesome at one point. Um, I couldn't be happier right now, honestly. And I can tell you that uh, 10 years ago or, or more, maybe 
I was listening to Skip on a podcast. Literally had no connection to Skip whatsoever. And now, you know, we, we do this show every couple of weeks. You know, we record episodes all the time. So it's like I, I really enjoy doing what I'm doing and I get to help other people too, you know, directly through coaching and then through all the shows we do. And you know what? We help people in ways that we don't even know. Like people, there are people that have messaged us that are like, hey, I was going through a tough time. And, you know, Skip said this funny thing and it made me laugh. You know, it, it really yeah. does. We we help people and I'm grateful for that. So it, I don't know what else I would do, but it would be something along these lines. It definitely wouldn't be working for somebody else in a corporate office. I can tell you that much. That's for sure. <laughs> well, that was a bad setup for me then. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wouldn't be a corporate office, but um, I would like to write... I'd like to be a writer for commercials or sitcoms. <laughs> Holy I, shit. I, honestly, I just think I wouldn't want to be SNL because that's too cutthroat. That would be, and there's a lot of drugs involved and very, very You take sleep. a lot of drugs already, though. That's true. That is a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they are taking the same drugs I am. Oh, they're different ones, true. yeah. I, I see commercials. I'm the type of guy that watches commercials and, and subconsciously critique, critiques them. Do you? And, and I really am impressed when there is a an ongoing commercial or commercial series that has the same theme with a the company, and they're very witty, and they're very – I just – I have always been I don't want to say attracted to that but that's been something that's always been appealing to me if I had to have a regular job the thing is is I was not cut out for regular and I did for years I mean what's I a dream job kid. but what else would it, you do it didn't say like if you had a regular job but what else would you do you could be yeah. a line tamer if you wanted to yeah I suppose maybe I would have a cattery maybe yeah. I would breed <laughs> I would bring bulls and savannah cats. I, I don't know. But if it had to be a, a more of a regular job, I know that that's what I would. That's always been appealing to me. Or just write in general. I mean, I always say if I ever wrote for a mainstream magazine, like something like GQ or Vogue or something or Cosmopolitan, I would probably find that, like, if I ever had an article that would be used, submitted and used, I would probably find that to be a, a very satisfying. Um, goal. That's cool. Yeah, I could totally see all those things. Every single thing you mentioned. What about you, Andrew? You're back. What's what's your what would be your dream job? And if you weren't working in bodybuilding, what would you do? Probably uh, historian. Um, yeah, yeah, that like makes American. sense. Yeah, focusing on American history primarily, okay. but also world history from 1760s through to present. I guess. Okay. Yeah. I thought about you. I've been reading this book um, about Michigan ghost stories of the Upper Peninsula. And it was <laughs> it was such a popular area back in the 1800s because of the copper boom and the iron boom. And mm -hmm. it's more it's mostly about the history. You know what I mean? Like of catastrophes mm -hmm. that happened or the history of hotels and people who died in them. You know, then there'll be like a little bit about these ghost stories of the, that tie into the past. But I thought about you because I know about your love of history. So that would be your would, would that be the job you would do if you weren't doing this? Or is that your ultimate dream job? Uh, well, there's probably like no money in reading books. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I'm going to assume that I won the lottery that Skip okay. alluded to earlier in the podcast. It was and before then, the show. Yeah. It was before, before the, the show. show. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's how I would spend my time probably. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And yeah. Nate's going to be a deep tissue guy since you, I don't know if you caught that part. No, very cool. Very well, cool. We think you're a good move taking the, the, uh, that company, I think it's a great idea. You should run with that, right. that website right. idea where you punch yeah. in what you want and they send it to you. Yeah. I was going to call I mean, no it. One's, like, no one's thought of it, so you well, probably nobody. shouldn't be talking about it publicly. Somebody will jump on that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. Andrew, we'll, call this, we'll call this the Andrew. training. The what? I was going to say, Andrew has his own show on like one of those home network t television shows. And he's yeah. like renovating houses. Like that's that was, <laughs> so that actually would be a close second to tell you the truth. Cause like, I really do enjoy home projects like building and stuff yeah. like that. Like, like I just built a fence out back for last oh, week. Yeah. It looked good. Uh, we've redone some, some rooms in the house and everything. So yeah, it is, it's, it's fun. Like, and I don't know anything. I never knew anything about it. And I followed this guy on, um, on YouTube called Mr. Build it. And like his whole motto and he sells tons of merch. He's, he's a millionaire is like, you need to break shit to fix shit. 
And huh. I think it makes a lot of sense because, like, you're going to mess up, like, your first five times doing something. And but you pick up all those skills along the way so that the next time you go to mm-hmm. that kind of project, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to save myself $300 and six hours of misery, and I'm going to get this done very quickly. So, yeah. It's like, like buddy, we all broke shit in the beginning, and now look at where we are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. It's the same thing, basically. So I think we'll, we, we've got a couple other little things to, uh, to handle at the end of this episode, but we can leave it with just being a big, this is like a training extravaganza. So I think that's mm-hmm. a, a really good thing we've got going here. Um, I wanted to address this comment, said, uh, love the show. Uh, as usual, I am curious about uh, why we protect coaches that hurt, hurt athletes with their protocols. Shouldn't we say their names? So people are at no risk when hiring these guys. And I think that was in reference to me not wanting to mention the name of the coach. I said there was a big name coach who worked with one of my clients, uh, the guy who hired me, and he, he, yeah. he pushed him up too heavy, and he had a real difficult time cutting afterward. Now, I wouldn't say that that was a health thing, first of all. I don't think that he, he hurt him in any way. And you can't know what's going to happen uh, mm-hmm. with with loading somebody up and trying to get them as big as possible until you actually do it. Like we've all said, you need to go through a phase of like really bulking heavy and putting on the weight. And you know what? If you don't do well with coming back down, then you'll know not to do that again in the future. And that's what this guy has learned. I think that's what he's referencing. And if so, I had a response for him. But instead of texting it out, I figured I'd just say it here on the show that we don't we don't want to play that game. I don't want to play that game. I don't want to play that game where that coach isn't here to defend himself and say his exactly. side. And I stab him in the back and talk crap about him on the Internet. You know what I'm saying? I'm just not going to play that game. I know that you guys mm-hmm. would like for me to play that game, but we don't do that shit here. So that's that's my response to him. Well, so I'm not well, going to I was just going to say, that? not all the time, like you don't have all the information from the client, right? right? Exactly. It's very hard to just say, oh, well, this guy did this or that, right? Without having the full story. And how many times have we been in positions where maybe a client was running their mouth or full of crap and we were like, well, that's not the full story. This person wasn't, you know, doing the program right or whatever, whatever. So sometimes it's hard, you know what I mean? It's a speculation. So you don't want to speculate as well to... But in this industry, like when I say industry, I mean YouTube and really fitness and social media, it would be a much more sexy story for us to just call him out and say all this crap Mm -hmm. without being 100% certain about any of it. And I've seen it happen to too many people and I just don't want to be a part of that. So I would say that I would be very careful listening to anybody that is just randomly calling people out. You just got to be careful with that stuff. Yeah, it opens also add Pandora's this. Box, oh, ahead, I think. Uh, yeah, it opens yeah. a Pandora's box. <clears throat> really what you're doing is you're helping to potentially take the industry and what we do in a completely different direction. And Nate took the words out of my mouth. The information that we have is rarely straight from that person. There's always two sides. There's actually three sides <laughs> to the story um, because the truth usually does lie somewhere in the middle. And I put myself in that position like Nate said. I would really, and it has happened. I I mean, obviously over the years it has happened to some degree. And there are prep guys that we just don't get along because I had someone publicly attack me without my name, but publicly attack me. And I didn't appreciate because I knew exactly that he was talking about and ended up reaching out to him and it got nasty. And the only thing that they did was listen to a client that had left me without basically without the things happening that should have happened or could have happened because of a lack of execution. So it, it's just really a, you're opening a Pandora's box and, and it's not a rabbit hole that I care to go down to. I think it's a level of respect to of admitting this is what basically saying this is what I've heard. This is the information that I have and not putting it directly on that person, but saying this is something that if if this is true, this is egregious or this is this is just bad work. Yeah. All right. I wanted to make sure we covered that. And I know, Skip, you had uh, we had one other one here that we were going to this is this is like where we went dark. This is uh, this is the last segment of the show is that uh, BSG goes dark. We all we all saw this comment and none of us responded to it. Geez. You guys need to study peptides more. 
bring me on the show and I'll teach y'all. LOL. Yeah. Well, this this, this person, I, I did look on their page and they've got tons of instructional videos on the biochemistry and the break. I'm just kidding. They don't have any of that. It's a, it's a ghost <laughs> profile that they just came on to talk some smack. Uh, but oh. the, I, the, I think this person missed the, the, the point of the podcast that we did was discerning which pot, which peptides or research chemicals are worth a darn and which ones do we kind of just put off the shelf as, as, as I'll call it snake oil, I guess, you know, or, or pipe dreams, you know? And I thought that's exactly what we did. And it was based off of our experience of many, many years of trying these things ourselves, having clients try them and then determining whether they produce positive results or not. So nowhere were we talking about breaking down chemistry pathways or any of that stuff with, with the podcast. Um, so yeah, this person can suck it. Yeah, I'll go a little bit darker, but I'll still remain <laughs> respectful. Uh, and the reason I say that I'll remain respectful is it could have just been an in, a kind of a jab in jest and, you know, kind of a joke and roll with it. But the problem is, is because, that you know, when I read something like that, I immediately get irritated because I just think to myself, if you have anything to back that up, because you don't. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but I'm just making a very black and white matter of fact statement by saying you don't, because if we gathered 10 other Andrews and 10 other Skips and 10 other Nates and 10 other Scots in a room, they're literally going to say the same thing that we said, too. Man, We're not yeah. holding back secrets. We're not uneducated. We're not, it's almost like saying, well, Skip, you've never used HMB. I mean, you don't know the growth potential. they can. Have. It's just <laughs> silly to me. It's just silly. And if those compounds were creating the, the level of physiques that every, a lot of the lower level bodybuilders and lower level competitors and guys might, who might not even compete, which is fine, but, and they think they just give those things too much credit. Those mm -hmm. things are not being used at the higher levels for a reason. They are predominantly being used massive. I'd, I'd go so far, this is an arbitrary number, I'm just throwing it out here to make my point. I'd say 75%, if not higher, of the exotic peptide use is being used by very low-level bodybuilders slash people who work out. And I stand yeah. on that 100%. Yeah. And if it was a joke and it was made in jest, and that's okay. That's fine. I said my piece. <laughs> Andrew, and you said in text. Yeah. What's that? Andrew said on text here, like it, you said a good term, majoring in the minor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's what, okay, let's just say that pedulated MGF, whatever, XYZ, did something. If yeah. it does something, it's so unnoticeable, it's like 0.001% positive mm -hmm. anabolism. Okay. So that's what I consider majoring in the minor. Like the majoring stuff that you should be majoring in. Um, eating your meals on time, getting quality protein sources, et cetera, hitting your training hard, you know, uh, um, getting the tried and true PEDs, you know, like I've never had someone say testosterone didn't do anything for me. Right. <laughs> like I've never had someone say yeah. we did 800 megs of tests and I didn't see a single thing. It's like, mm -hmm. well, show me someone who doesn't respond well to growth hormone. Even so it, even so and far, I'll show as you fake growth hormone. hormone. I'll show you fake growth hormone. Now. <laughs> and, and and then tell me that they use peptides and and they like oh yeah this is a secret. It's just it's yeah. borderline laughable. All right. Well, it's well we got to believe that like something like Ipamorlin or Sermorlin, if because it's a lot cheaper. Well, maybe if I just take three or four extra doses of that, mm -hmm. it's going to equal four units of growth hormone, and it just doesn't, guys. It just doesn't. Remember Nate's comment? He was like, geez, this guy's got all the letters of the alphabet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, we've got another one to go dark on at the end of the next episode. We'll save it for that. We'll call it going dark with Skip, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> with all that said, guys, uh, you can reach out to all of us for coaching, bodyberry.com. You can go to teamskip.com. Uh, what's the best way to reach out to you, Nate? Uh, just Instagram at Nate Spear, just one, just my name, and shoot me a message. Yeah. You're cranking out YouTube stuff now, aren't you, too? Like, you're doing more of it. Yeah, yeah definitely. I got a new video dropping on Tuesday, some arm training, actually. So there's a lot of good tips and cues in there. So my, my YouTube's actually nasty, Nate Spear. So there's a lot of good training cues on a lot of my videos, and I break down sort of my thoughts on training and get really in-depth in the training. So if you guys are looking for some training stuff, it's definitely good over there. 
Excellent. That'll be and, the next show. We'll just take Nate's arm train and pick it apart. Yeah. <laughs> show him what he show him what he's doing wrong and how much better he could be if he did it our way. <laughs> His arms are like 23 inches right now. I know. I tried to oh, say Jesus. that with a straight face. <laughs> uh, check out our sponsors, truenutrition.com. Use our code THINK, uh, supplementsource.ca for our Canadians. Uh, Amino Asylum, use code THINK. And, of course, thank you to everybody from Patreon. We appreciate having you guys here and supporting the show. And for another episode of Blood, Sweat, and Gear, we'll see you soon. Thank <laughs> you.